I've been at MIT for uh, a rather depressing number of decades. Uh, but uh, during that time, uh, uh, right from when I first came here, I think the Institute has uh, always shown uh, tremendous leadership in advancing the uh, role of women in, uh, in academia, uh, at MIT and, and beyond. Uh, that leadership has always stemmed from the top, and uh, that will be continuing with our new 17th president of MIT, who I am pleased to introduce, Raphael Reif. Thank you. Good afternoon. What a terrific gathering indeed. Uh, I'm delighted to be here. I want to first thank, I want to echo what was said earlier, thank MITE and DUE uh, for the collaboration that created such a terrific symposium. And uh, clearly I want to uh, mention quickly the name of Melanie Kenderdine and her team for putting together this really terrific symposium. So thank you very much, Melanie, indeed. Thank you. I'm also delighted to be here because I'm honoring Millie Dresselhaus. And uh, uh, you're going to hear a couple of testimonials from people for whom uh, Millie has made a huge impact in their lives. And after that, I'll come back to say a few words myself. We'll start with Dr. Marcy Black, who is the CDO, CDO of Bandgap Engineering. She has three MIT degrees, and one of them a PhD from ECS. And shortly after Marcy finishes, we're going to hear from Dr. Sandra Brown, who is a patent attorney with Foley and Larner, and she has a PhD in physics. So let's start with Dr. Marcy Black, followed right after by Dr. Sandra Brown. Marcy, are you here? How are you? So I'm not a Buddhist. But in Buddhism, there's something called a bat bat vista, And a bat vista is defined as one who brings enlightenment. And I think by that definition, Millie Dresselhaus is a science bat -hitzva. So Millie may not dress the part, um, but she, she uh, just like other bat -hitzvas, she spends a great deal of time meditating. Now, Millie's meditations are a little different than a traditional Buddhist in that they involve a lot more equations. <laughs> um, um, another way that she's similar to Bodhistas is that um, she also studies the connections between the cosmos. But these connections tend to be more thermal and electrical and maybe some optical connections. Um, and uh, she also sings a beautiful chants. But these chants come in the form of a classical violin you've ever heard Millie play. So I don't know, maybe the analogy isn't perfect, but in the one way it is perfect is Millie really is a gift. And she's a gift to us. She's a, I, when I think of Millie, I think of a teacher, I think of a mentor, and I think of just a good person. Um, so I, I remember, I have a couple stories that illustrate that. And um, I remember um, in my first year at MIT, I was a freshman, and uh, I was scared to death, like every, every freshman probably is. And I walked into M Millie's office, because she was my academic advisor, and uh, I was so nervous, and she just gave me a big smile, and she gave me a cookie. <laughs> and so afterwards, <laughs> afterwards, we sat down, and um, we came up with a plan for my freshman year, and I, I left it much less nervous and much more confident about, about the year and the plan for the year. Um, and Millie's n not just kind to MIT students, she's actually kind to everyone. I remember in a, a, later on in my career, uh, Millie and I were traveling across the bridge on one cold, snowy Thanksgiving weekend on the way to MRS, and uh, we, we took a taxi together. And you know, I was studying my talk and trying to figure out um, what questions people might ask me. Millie starts talking to the cab driver. And by the end of the cab ride, I knew all about the cab driver. I knew his kids' names, where he went on vacation. I knew everything about him. So Millie is always nice to everyone. It doesn't matter who they are. Um, so Millie's kindness is well known, but what's really legendary about her is, is her integrity and her work ethic. So I think anyone who knows Millie will agree to that. And I have so many Millie stories that demonstrate this, but 
Um, I, I picked one because it really changed my career. Um, so when I returned to MIT for my PhD and I was deciding what work I wanted to do, Millie's work really intrigued me and um, work such as um, Dr. Brown's who's speaking next, but I frankly didn't understand it. <laughs> it was, it's very complicated. And so I talked to Millie about this and Millie said, don't worry, I'll, I'll catch you up. And, uh, and she did. Um, so I signed up for her advanced solid state physics class um, that met early for MIT student at 9 a.m. And uh, you know, I, I tried really hard on the problem sets and I asked tons of questions. And after a couple weeks, Millie figured out the pattern that, of why I was having trouble, that I, I just really didn't have the background to, to understand it. So Millie did something very creative. She decided to have an optional recitation and to, I think she did this intentionally to ensure that not anyone but me showed up. She scheduled it at 8 a.m., which is like in the middle of the night for a grad student. And so at 8 a.m., I was the only one that showed up every week. And every week, I had Millie one-on-one -on -one for a whole hour just teaching me solid state physics. So I, I really learned solid state physics very well after that. Um, so this isn't an isolated an example of, of how Millie's a very hard worker. Um, while I was a PhD student, she worked for the Office of Science. And usually when you're in such a position, um, an important position that's so busy, all your other responsibilities will get neglected. But that didn't happen. Um, she made sure to fly home every weekend and meet with every single graduate student the whole time she was in the Office of Science. So sometimes uh, we, as grad students, figured that she must have cloned herself in order to do all, all this work. It just wasn't possible to do it any other way. Um, but Sally, there's, there is only one Millie, and that's why we, we treasure her so much. Um, so, you know, there's, there's so much Millie has done for science, for women, and for MIT. Um, and it's hard to say how, how many obstacles she's overcome and blaze the path for, for all of us. Um, and, but I, I, I can't really tell you about all that, but what I can tell you is just how grateful I am to, to be Millie's student and our friend. Millie changed my life, and I'm not exaggerating. When I started at MIT, my parents, my five siblings, and I were living in a two-bedroom apartment in a rough area of the Bronx. Sorry, Marcy started me. <laughs> so neither of my parents had more than a few years of a primary school education in Jamaica, and I knew what life I might go back to if I didn't succeed at MIT. Yet until I joined Millie's lab, I was floundering. I couldn't find a lab. I was considering a transfer to a different school, but after a single meeting with Millie, I decided to stay. I remember it clearly. She asked me a few questions about my physics background. She told me about her solid state physics and group theory classes. And she introduced me to the other members of the lab. And that was it. I had found my place. And I, I marked that first meeting with Millie as a major turning point in my life and in my career. Uh, Millie has remained my mentor even after I left MIT 12 years ago. She's always a willing advisor and sounding board for my career uh, decisions, including when I moved into patent law, which was a bit scandalous at the time, I remember. She continually gives support and encouragement. She's ever vigilant for new opportunities for her present and former students. But what I find most fascinating about Millie is her work ethic. She doesn't slow down. I try my best to follow her example but there is, there is, you're always second best when it comes to that. And I'm, I know I'm not her only former student with this kind of story. Millie has helped launch the careers of countless numbers of students and young scientists from many walks of life, male and female alike. Yet I think her greatest influence might be with young women scientists. Last I checked, there were only seven African American women in history in history with a PhD in physics from MIT. Two of us graduated from Millie's lab. I'm honored to have this opportunity to share my experiences with Millie. 
I would not be where I am without her. Thank you, Sandra. Thank you, Marcy. Uh, Millie, actually, as somebody said earlier, Millie doesn't just, didn't just help her students. He helped everybody. She even helped me. Uh, when I was uh, a junior faculty member, I, I also came to MIT a few decades ago. Not as many as Ernie's, but I said a few decades ago. <laughs> and uh, when I came to MIT, Millie was director of what we call at MIT CMSC, Center for Material Science and Engineering, with its home in Building 13. And I was assigned to that lab. And uh, indeed, I had a little office and a little lab. Uh, shortly after I arrived, I wrote my first proposal. That's what you're supposed to do very quickly when you're a junior faculty, as you all know. And I did. And I don't know whether Millie remembers this. That was a few decades ago. And I was just one of the many you helped. So Millie learned that I've written something. And she's offered to read it. Well, I was scared to death, but, uh, <laughs> but she offered to read it. Uh, I'm not going to turn that down. I didn't expect her to read it, actually. I did give it to her. The next day, he came back to my office with red marks all over the place. <laughs> um, I looked at the red marks, and they made a lot of sense. I paid attention to every one of them, and I submitted a proposal, and guess what? It got accepted, and that's how I got started. I can tell you many more, many more stories about that. One thing that maybe even Millie herself doesn't know is that one of the many reasons why I came to MIT was Millie herself. When I came to interview, and believe me, I was living a very happy life in the West Coast. I had no business doing anything to do with the East Coast. Um, and I came to MIT because of that interview. And one of the people that interviewed me was Millie. Anybody who spends a few minutes with her quickly recognizes the absolutely brilliance of her mind. She has a brilliant mind. I don't think I've ever met anybody with the brilliance of her mind. And her clarity of thought and articulation of her thoughts. And I haven't seen Millie in action for a number of years because I've been distracted doing other stuff in the last few years. But last, I think it was three weeks ago, I was in Oslo and I had the pleasure of seeing Millie and two other MIT faculty members receive the Kavli Prize. It was awarded, it's, it's one of those important laureates that are given the Kavli every other year in three categories. There were seven awards given, three of them from MIT. And I don't know whether you know that three MIT awards went to three women. Uh, Emily was one of them. And, uh, and we have a, a gala dinner with a thousand people, the King of Norway sitting right next to Emily. And uh, whom do the laureates choose to give the speech to thank uh, the Oslo Kavli Award and, uh, and to talk about basic research by Emily Dresselhaus? Did she have much warning? Not really, but there she went. Upstairs, just imagine her in front of a thousand people and, and, and a king. I've never seen a king before. That was my first time. And he was in the room. And she gives a very a remarkable, clear, amazing speech. So Millie is Millie. There is only one. Millie, can you please come and join me for a moment? Millie, I want to say this is for everything you've done to promote the career of women in science and technology, for everything you've done for clean energy, please accept I have the honor to present to you the C3E Lifetime Achievement Award. Always being clear and articulate, this is not going to stop you here. <laughs> Thank you so much, Raphael and uh, Ernie and everybody else. I just like to make a very few comments. Uh, I think everybody exaggerates a bit. <laughs> uh, you know, 
when we come uh, in our careers and we find a place that's welcoming and where you can work and just focus on your passion, uh, that is wonderful. And that's what happened to me when I joined, I came to MIT in 1960, so it is a long time ago. But before that time, uh, I was at different places where being a woman was not a great advantage. And uh, when I showed up here, it didn't make any difference. So it's a meritocracy, and you're evaluated for what you do. And I think that's the most important thing for the advancement of women. So MIT, when I came here, had 4% women. And uh, that was the student body. Among the faculty was even less than that. So you could imagine that you didn't see women very often. And teaching in electrical engineering, that, that's where I started. And then physics, uh, we, I was teaching all ma male classes many times. But uh, it didn't really matter, because it's what you can produce that counts. And I'm very grateful for having been here for now over 50 years and still doing it. So uh, that's a wonderful opportunity. <clears throat> so uh, a couple of more things, uh, maybe. Uh, this award is for clean energy. So what did I ever do for clean energy? Yes, I worked for the Department of Energy. But you know, that wasn't really my idea. That was somebody else's idea. And uh, one day, I get a telephone call. And it's from the Secretary of Energy asking me uh, if I would be willing to come down and uh, head up the Office of Science. I said, what? <laughs> me? <laughs> uh, but uh, after being coaxed by many of my pals at MIT that this was a good thing to do, that I could still keep up my work, sort of, somehow. Uh, I went down and uh, did that job uh, through the end of the Clinton administration. And well, my idea was to try to help train the next person taking over the job. That was really my idea. I think Ernie knows that. He was my boss at the time. And, uh, but what happened was the moment that the new administration came in, we all got fired. <laughs> So I came back happily to MIT. But it was a great experience uh, um, uh, being in charge. Of, I've been in charge of other things before, so this wasn't exactly the first thing. But um, doing something for energy, doing something that the world cares about. You know, for the most part, when you do basic science, you do it for, for the love of science. And, and most of the things you do, nobody cares about except you know, the people that read your papers, but <laughs> that's a small community. Uh, but working in the energy field, you get a chance to have some impact. So all of you people in this room uh, who are thinking about clean energy, you're very lucky because you'll be doing something somebody cares about uh, in addition to doing your, what you, what's your passion. So that's uh, really a, a great thing. Um, I'll just make one more comment. Uh, the uh, award in, in energy uh, for the science space uh, came about through sort of an accident. Uh, and I own up to this. So I got into energy research uh, really seriously in the 1990s, 1992, to be precise. And it was brought about by the need of two countries, France and the United States, for uh, the conversion of thermal energy, that's most of which is waste heat to you, and is thrown away, and making use of that for something. Um, I never thought of doing that, but the French Navy and the US Navy both had the idea that after 30 years of not uh, being able to exploit about half the energy that we get from the sun, being in the form of thermal energy, and all the uh, thermal energy we throw away, it would be maybe useful to be able to use some of that. So uh, uh, they asked me what I thought about it. You know, 
teaching at MIT, you're supposed to have some ideas, right? That's, that's what the whole point is of teaching. And uh, so I thought about this for a while, and I came up with the idea of using nano as a way to change the mat properties of materials, and that, that actually turned out to work. Uh, surprisingly, I was lucky. And uh, so that's uh, one of the impacts that I personally had on the energy field. And we harvested that approach now for almost 20 years, but now we're doing other things too. Uh, so uh, the use of thermal energy now uh, has some new roots. So I'm really happy for that and getting involved in some of the new roots, of course. So, uh, so life goes on. And uh, maybe the parting uh, comment that I would make is uh, doing research is so exciting, it keeps you young and active. So I get up in the morning and I feel the same as I did for many, many years. And I sort of wish it on you that you can have a long career and enjoy life as much as I have. So thank you for the award. <laughs>